but he took a cab and was dropped off at the main doors of the hospital. And he walked through the lobby and then out back out in the parking lot and across the street to the mental health facility was in a, a long three-story building. And he went into the bathroom, went into a bathroom stall and with his bag and, and prepared his weapon in there. Alrighty, folks, just a heads up. I've seen you in the comments section lamenting the fact that there are two part episodes. So if you're not the kind of person to wait a week to get the whole thing, pause this, turn it off, come back next week and listen to both hours. This is a two part episode. I repeat a two part episode. So with that said, let's get to our commercial and our show. I hope you enjoy it. You know, if you guys have been listening to the show for a while, you've heard more than one episode where OC spray got someone out of a bind and prevented them from having to use more force in a personal self-defense encounter. Palm Industries is the OC of choice for active self-protection. We love everything about them. We love the efficacy of their product. We've seen it work. Our actual employees have had to use it in the field, and it worked. Look, they've removed any excuse not to carry OC. This is going to solve far more problems more frequently than a firearm, and I wouldn't leave the house without it. As I've said before, I got one for my wife, I got one for my daughter, my son is about to go into law enforcement, carries one, and I've had a good friend, uh, Soleil Rocher, who's a member of the active self-protection team, who used it successfully in a real-life defensive encounter. Get one at get-asp.com slash P-O-M, POM, get-asp.com slash POM. All right, gang, welcome back to the Active Self-Protection Podcast. I am your host, Mike Williver. I am your favorite Former Fed, although today's guest was not so much a, a Fed Fed, but he worked for the federal government for the United States Air Force uh, in the um, law enforcement division of that uh, branch of the service. Uh, he is married with two kids, and he is the author of a book, Warnings Unheeded, Twin Tragedies at Fairchild Air Force Base. Did I get that right, Andy, the name of the book? Yes. Very good. Correct, yeah. And the, the book um, discusses two tragic incidents at the same base that happened relatively closely to each other time-wise, uh, one of them being an active shooter on the base, uh, the other one being a uh, tragic aircraft accident. So we will talk about um, both of those things in some detail. So Andy, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. So uh, is there a family history in your family of military service? I know mine has one. Is there? Does that go back or were you the first person to be a military member in your in your household? My grandfather and father were in the Navy and my brother and sister went into the army and the air force. So now pretty, pretty much a long history of military service. Okay. So you grew up in a household where the military life and the sort of thing was familiar. So w would you say that you had a, a young introduction to the idea of, of self-defense firearms handling that sort of thing, or is that something you didn't pick up until later in life? Yeah, no, oddly enough, there no, not to really, really not too many firearms in the household, other than a, a shotgun and a maybe a twenty-two rifle. But my dad never shot. I pretty much just picked it up on my own, graduating from BB guns up to to a twenty-two rifle, and didn't do a lot of pistol shooting until I got into the military. So I've always had a fascination with with firearms, though, just with the mechanics of it and and such. Yeah, there's a there's a YouTube channel I recommend to anyone. I, I'll think of the name of it and I'll put it in the notes of this episode. But the guy just has these uh, detailed animations of various popular firearms. Have you seen this? And he I've seen some like that. Yeah, it breaks down how they work. It's absolutely fascinating. And if you have a if you have a mind for that sort of thing for the engineering of a firearm, it's really cool. And I, I will get the name of that channel and post it in the notes for this one. So why the Air Force? I I always ask people who ha have military service. Uh, why they pick the branch they pick. So what drew you to the Air Force versus any of the other branches? I grew up in a Navy town in Port Orchard, Washington. There's Puget Sound Naval Shipyard there. But I had an uncle that was in the Air Force, and I think he might have put a bug in my ear, but just it was common knowledge that the Air Force took better care of their people, had better facilities, better food, and just a better duty overall. So that's how I went into the air force it's a good reason as any you know my dad said my dad was a sub skipper um back in the diesel boat days in the north atlantic playing tag with the soviets and he used to say that uh, one reason to go uh be a submarine sailor versus anything else is the food's a lot better you get steak and you know that's that's one of those yeah. things so the uh air force at the time remind me what year you eod'd in the air force went in in 89 okay right after high school okay so 
basic training back then. Um, for those who don't know, in the military, this is generally speaking, they're, um, you, you start off, no matter what the branch of service is, in a basic training situation. They're all a little different, but it's just to, to sort of break down the civilian version of you and build up a military version of you. If that's not too general, I apologize if it is. And then after basic training where you get, it's just like it says, basic training, you're taught basic firearms handling and, and good order and discipline and how to wear uniform and how to march. Then uh, after that, there is a usually a school, depending on what your military occupational specialty is going to be. You know, you could, you could be anything from a, um, a nuclear reactor uh, engineer to a military policeman or, uh, you know, a, a medic. So there's lots of different paths to go. So after that, there is a secondary school. So talk to us about your basic training, Andy, and how you feel, um, how you feel it was, was it sufficient? And how was the firearms training in particular? In basic training, the, the firearms was very basic. I don't even remember any of the, the training that we got really. It was probably some quick, basic fundamentals of side alignment, but it was pretty much no training involved other than just how to safely put rounds down range and then move on to the next um, course of training. Um, it was a little bit more advanced in our tech school after I graduated basic right. training and went into law enforcement tech school. Yeah, because as a law enforcement um, professional, you're going to be probably going to be carrying at least a, a pistol every day. So remind us what the pistol was the uh, military had at that point. What was the standard issued pistol? That was back in that day. That was the uh, Beretta M9. It was like the Beretta 92 for the civilian version. This, the training the still was pretty basic, though. We were just putting 36 rounds down target into a cardboard silhouette. And if you got 36 on the paper, you qualified as expert. And not a whole lot involved, just shooting from a couple of different distances. And then one one position was behind a barricade. Yeah, and for those who don't know that the the uh, M9 or the 92 or 92 FS, I think it was also called, was a very popular uh, pistol. It was kind of that and the Glock were your major options for law enforcement that back in that period of time. In fact, 89 is really when I, if I recall correctly, I was a police explorer at the time, and I think that's when most civilian law enforcement agencies were transitioning from revolvers to semi semi automatic pistols. Uh, were, did you do any uh, any M4 AR15 training in your your tech school? I don't. There may have been, but it was primarily focused on the pistol because I was in the, my career field was either you were in law enforcement or security specialist. Security specialists guarded the airplanes mostly, and they were armed with the rifle. And patrolmen, law enforcement, used the Beretta. So our primary weapon was the pistol, and we focused on that mostly. Yeah, the reason I ask is it, it had you had one at your disposal, the incredible shot that you made might have been a little easier had you had a long gun. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it would have would have been a little bit harder. I was on bike patrol that day; it would be kind of hard to sling a rifle on a bike. But That's true. I could have been done. Yeah, I mean, if you look now, a lot of these motorcycle officers, at least in Arizona, have the really neat mm -hmm. setup where they lock an M like a collapsible M4 onto the back of their motorcycle. So times have definitely changed since then. When I when I first started in LE. Uh, there might be, you know, one shotgun on a squad, you know, for a night and no, zero rifles. Rifles weren't a thing really for civilian Ellie at the time, but that's obviously changed a lot since North Hollywood and, you know, Columbine and a number of other things. So walk us through um, the, the, before this incident happened, we're talking about the, the active shooter and you can name him, you name him in your book. Uh, you can name him if you want to or not. It doesn't matter to me. You can call him the shooter or whatever. Uh, walk us through. So just give us an overview of prior to this incident, all the things that that kind of uh, should have warranted him not having been there that day or, or having been dealt with a lot sooner than this. And do you think and I guess the next question is, do you think he would have done what he did regardless if he had been kicked out of the Air Force two years prior? Would this still have happened? Well, the individual was a grievance collector. So if it hadn't happened in the Air Force. I think eventually something would have happened to where he would focus his attention and and um, dwell on and think that every everything that was said or done to him was malicious. Um, so yeah, I think it may have eventually happened, but it it wouldn't have happened in the Air Force, and maybe somebody would have got him help 
prior to, but there were quite a few instances that people recognized that the individual needed help and definitely shouldn't have been in the military from his tech school, from basic training through tech school and at every one of his bases, every one of his work places, there were people saying that he was going to be a workplace violence threat. And they were trying to get people to recognize that and, and people were just not paying attention or ignoring their warnings. If you, if you read the book, folks, and I highly recommend reading the book or getting the audio book, uh, wherever you, wherever you do audio books, uh, there's a ton of uh, services for that. I recommend the book highly because uh, we spoke before we hit the record button and I was telling Andy how much I admired the exhaustive research that had to have gone in because there is not a single aspect of this story that can be known that isn't in the book. And I think it would be, this should be required reading for anyone in a leadership position. And I mean, NCOs all the way up to generals uh, in any organization like a military organization, police department, heck, fire department, anything where this should be something they they have to sit down and read before they're handed the keys to um, leadership in, in a military type situation. Because it, as we discussed earlier, some of it was passing the buck. Some of it was not recognizing that something needed to be done. But there, if, if you look at the book, there are so many instances where his behavior, um, the shooter's behavior is just so, so in, in, incredibly inappropriate or um, repetitive, and it's obvious to the casual observer reading the book that something needed to be done long before it was. Uh, so walk us through the day of, uh, you were assigned to a bike patrol that day, and uh, just kind of walk us through what happened. And I also was going to ask you, when you first got word of this going on, what was going through your head? Were you thinking um, this was what it was, or perhaps you thought there was a terrorist attack or something else? Because I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that mass shooters, active shooters, this wasn't a, as common a thing, or it wasn't at least as commonly covered back then. So it wasn't like there was a lot of active shooter training in the early 90s. So walk us through your day and, and kind of what was going through your head. Yeah, this was before Columbine. So the term active shooter hadn't even been coined yet, and nobody was training for it. Law enforcement wasn't training for active shooter response. Um, I didn't think that the training we got on firearms was was enough. So I had out of my own pocket purchased a clone of the Beretta, the, the Taurus. It was a 92 also, but it was made by Taurus instead of Beretta. So I could go out off duty and practice because we weren't allowed to carry our guns off duty. We had to turn our Berettas into the armory every night and get issued them every, every morning or every day before shift. So I had known that our firearms training wasn't adequate enough. So I had gone out and bought that rifle or that pistol so I could practice off duty. And if I couldn't afford the ammo, then I would dry fire practice it. Just being able to line up the sights and pull the trigger without disturbing that sight picture. Um, and I had also didn't think the training we had on, on being a patrolman was enough. So I'd read books and one of the most important things that I read in a books by Charles Remsburg, was mental rehearsal so every night before i would go to sleep i'd lie in bed and i would imagine a scenario that i might encounter and i would like detail picture myself how i would respond and see myself responding to that threat and and ending that threat and i think that came in handy on that day because i didn't have to think is this happening and what should i do I, it just was autopilot. I just responded, just naturally reacted to, to what I saw in front of me without being shocked by it or, or questioning it. I had never rehearsed an active shooter event, but I had rehearsed quite a few lethal force encounters in my head. So when I was presented with one in real life, it wasn't, uh, it was as, as if it wasn't the first time I'd been experiencing it. I remember those books you were referring to. Uh, one was called Street Survival, and I can't remember the name of the other one, but I remember poring over those as a young man preparing for career in law enforcement. And I can't say enough. I think they're still relevant, actually. And yes. I, I just want to say mental rehearsal is one of the things I, I push here every time we discuss a critical incident. Mental rehearsal is critical. Getting a mental rep in is free 
for starters. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time or effort or preparation. You're literally just saying, okay, you know, you're walking into the store. If I do, I take a moment before I walk into the Circle K or the Seven Eleven and kind of look and see what's going on first. And then if I get in there and something's going on, if this then that, you know, if I see someone behind the counter holding a gun, am I gonna engage? Am I gonna am I gonna walk out the door because it's too dangerous? Or what am I gonna do? So I love the idea that you were you were doing that and. I, Dry fire back then wasn't uh, wasn't nearly as popular as it is now. So I'm impressed you you were doing that before it was cool. You know before before yeah. it was before it was a thing. So well done. Uh, and I love the idea that you were taking the initiative uh, on your own because, as you said, military police officers back then. I'm not sure about now, but at the end of your shift, any weapons you have, any taser, any rifle, any shotgun, pistol, it goes back to the armory and gets locked up, which is that changed by the way, as an aside, or is that still, still the same? No, it's still the same. The, um, com- base commanders of each installation could change that and they could allow more people to carry on duty at different workstations. They could have, have some people at every work center, like the hospital and the maintenance troops and, wherever they could have armed people they could uh authorize that but i don't think much has changed they don't even allow most places don't even allow on duty law enforcement to to carry and if they're not military talking about warnings unheeded after fort hood and after what happened at fairchild you would think they would have done something i don't know exactly what but something to change yeah change that because it seems insane to me that You've got a base full of people who are all, most of whom are, are qualified to carry a firearm and, and nobody can, it's just, you know, it's like sitting ducks. I, I grew up around Navy bases. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think I misspoke earlier. They, they don't allow off duty law enforcement to carry on the base. Right. Okay. On, on, on duty is the only people that are allowed to carry firearms on duty law enforcement. So, which is a, a shame. Yeah, it is a shame. Um, because you've got a whole bunch of people who were who would never ever misuse it and would conceal it and no one would ever know they had it, just like anywhere else. It's like off a military base, who would potentially be able to stop something much sooner? Because uh, as you'll hear in the story, you know, it took it took a while for the reports to come in and everyone to get squared away just to get over there to to get, start hunting for this guy. It took you know, I'm sure in your mind, especially at the time, a painfully long time. Uh, I'm sure you wanted to get in there as quickly as you could and and, and do what you could to help. So the day of, uh, you're assigned to a bike patrol. So walk us through your equipment. You're carrying the Beretta 9mm. What's the capacity of that? Uh, it's 15 round magazines. And you care, I assume you carried with a loaded chamber safety on? Loaded chamber, but not topped off. Yeah. So there would be one in the pipe and 14 left in the mag. Was there any reason for that? Was that like a, a standard thing or was it just something you did? That was standard. We were issued two 15 round magazines and we... we I don't think any of the other services carried loaded and on fire, but we did. So part of the procedure for arming up was to rack around in the chamber and and uh, decock and put it on, then put it back on fire and, and holster. So we carried ready to go um, and with one backup mag. Was it was the concern that if the magazine was was fully loaded, there'd be an issue with the gun cycling, or is it just it's just how it was done? Because I'm just wondering why they wouldn't avail yourself of that one extra round. Probably hard to keep track of all the the rounds. Um, mm-hmm. They'd have to issue you with two magazines and another round, and people would probably inevitably lose those rounds. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure that's not that's not cool to come come back to your. Um, to your uh, firearms issuance guy minus a round or two. I'm sure that would have been yeah. frowned upon. Absolutely. I was just glad they let us carry with a round in the chamber and on fire. Um, it was ball ammo, though. That was a, a always been a concern of mine that we weren't allowed to carry hollow points. Something about the some sort of a con- Geneva Convention or NATO treaty where uh, why that applies. Points- yeah, why that applies yeah. stateside is beyond me. Why in our exactly. own base? Yeah, you're not allowed to carry hollow points on the battlefield, but we weren't uh, in the battlefield back at Fairchild Air Force Base or any other base on the U.S. in the U.S. Well, as a former that government employee, I can guarantee you that that came down to money. That came down to not wanting to spend the money on those rounds. Almost yeah, certainly, absolutely. Which is that has changed now. I understand that they are issuing hollow points now. Okay, so stateside defensive ammo. Yeah. Okay, good. That's good to know. 
Um, and for those who don't know, I know we have a lot of folks who listen to the show who aren't familiar with all the terminology. Ball ammo means it's just just imagine, you know, um, just a smooth wedge of uh, lead. Were they copper jacketed or no? Yeah, they were jacketed. Yeah. So 147 grain jacketed ball ammo. So you got 147 grains of lead with a copper jacket on it uh, versus a, um, a hollow point is just what it says. The tip of the round is hollow. And as it travels through the air, uh, once it hits the whatever it's going to hit, the idea is that that tip opens up and spirals out into a sort of a jagged star shape, and it does a lot more damage than than a ball ammo would. So that's why that's preferable to ball ammo. Let me ask you: Did you have any prior interactions with the shooter that you remember prior to this incident? I don't remember that from the book. I'm not sure if I. No, I didn't know who he was. Never had met him or encountered him. And there was never like a bolo for this guy, like, hey, this guy might go off or this guy just got kicked off the base. Um, you know, be aware that he's a potential threat. That was never nothing brought to your consciousness by anyone in leadership. Nothing that trickled down to the patrolman. So, no. Right. So I should back up for a moment. Kind of walk us through the the last couple of days before the incident, because I think that's critical. Um, he is finally... Um, kicked out of the Air Force and kind of just kind of walk us through that being kicked out and then what led up to him coming to shoot that day at the base because it's I think it's interesting uh, how he acquired the gun that sort of thing. Okay, sure. Yeah, at every point in where he had been identified as in need of mental health help and at Fairchild he, he had seen the base psychologist and psychiatrist and they both recommended his discharge and that's just the recommendation. The commander, his, the perpetrator's commander would have to take action on that and have him taken, removed out of the Air Force. But he overruled those recommendations and kept him in the military and then later regretted it and re- and reported, the commander reported him to mental health again. And then he was eventually sent to a psychiatric ward in Texas at Wolford Hall Medical Center in in San Antonio, where he spent 90 plus days on the inpatient psych ward there. And they recommended his discharge, but some, uh, some paperwork error or, or some, uh, some mistakes or uh, influenced by his mother, one thing or the other led, allowed him to stay in the military and was sent to another base where he was again in trouble with uh, mental health and, and was eventually discharged there from his base in uh, New Mexico. But by then he had fixated on the doctors back at Fairchild and blamed them for ruining his his career. So he flew back to Spokane from New Mexico. He made a few stops in between, but he ended up back in Spokane and, and purchased a rifle from a firearms dealer who dealt guns out of his home. He bought a uh, Mac 90, which is an AK-47 variant. And then at some other location, he bought a 75-round drum magazine and purchased about 80 rounds and loaded up that 75-round drum. So if he had, uh, I guess the, my question is, he had all his psychiatric stuff, the treatments were inside the military. There, I don't think we have any record of him going to see any sort of psychiatrist or psychologist or having any commitments or anything outside of of the military. So had he gone to a a modern gun dealer today and gone to get the NICS check, the background check, do you, you may not know, I'm not sure. Would he have popped for some kind of psychiatric issue to not sell him a gun? I mean, would that have been, would that stuff have been public or within the grasp of a NICS check? I wonder is my question. If the Air Force had been reporting to, to the proper authorities, I don't know what list he would have to have been on, but he still had to fill out the same paperwork that you fill out today, the, the form where you check off if you have ever been uh, like denounced your U.S. citizenship or mm-hmm. if you're a drug user or if you've been involuntarily committed to a mental health facility. Which he had. He, che- he had, but he lied on that form and said that he hadn't been. So if he'd answered correctly on that form, he may not have been allowed to purchase, but criminals don't abide by the law. So, Right. 
And you said earlier he's a grievance collector. I, yeah, the, the the number of perceived injustices that he laments uh, throughout the book is just astounding. Um, things that – imagining slights that didn't happen and imagining everyone's out to get him, a little bit of paranoia as well. Uh, the days before um, the eventual shooting at Fairchild, he, he was exhibiting all sorts of – not that anyone would have could have known or noticed, but – he was doing a lot of things that would lead one to believe he's getting ready to do something, maybe kill himself, maybe something else. So kind of talk us through that, like all the spending the money and the strip strip clubs and stuff like that. Yeah, he did a lot of weird behavior. He he was spent a lot of time and money down at the Deja Vu, which is a strip club in Spokane. He spent thousands of dollars on specific dancers, and he was talking to them about aliens coming down to the and impregnating Earth women and just a lot of bizarre things he followed one of the dancers home took a cab and followed her to her hotel room and a security guard chased him off um <clears throat> then when he was that was like the night before he went out to fairchild to the hospital when he uh took a cab out to the base right before he, the shooting the cab driver thought he was so he was acting so bizarrely he thought he was drugged or or drunk, but he also recognized that he had a large gym bag with a styrofoam gun case protruding out of it. So he knew he had a, a mentally incapacitated person, either drugged or drunk with a rifle. And he was bringing him out to a military base and didn't apparently didn't think twice about it. Didn't uh, report it to the gate guard or anything. Um, there's quite a few other instances where like he was trying to get, access to his medical records when he was at the uh, inpatient psych ward and he was writing letters to everybody trying to get their help, get him out of that facility. And he was saying, if I don't get these records, make sure they go to my next of kin, which would to me would suggest that he might be uh, thinking that he might not be alive much longer. Right. But there are quite a, quite a few things that people just didn't pick up on and or, didn't act on yeah another another red flag that that um i thought was very interesting was you know withdrawing basically all of his life savings and just sort of blowing mm -hmm. it quickly if you know if you know someone who's doing that that might be a cause for concern as well because he wasn't like he was retired and you know in his old age this is a guy who needed that money very badly so just one more yes. thing absolutely that's a good point he was very frugal he didn't spend money on hardly anything so yeah him to blow all that money to empty his bank account and, and just blow it all was a, would be a good clue. Yeah. All right. So, uh, June 20th, 1994, he walks, he, get, first of all, how does he get on the base in the first place? Well, the, the hospital was located outside of our perimeter fence at Fairchild in Spokane. It oh, was on right. land that was leased from the Spokane County. So anybody could have just driven up to the hospital, but he took a cab and uh with the gym bag and was dropped off at the main doors of the hospital and he walked through the lobby and then out back out in the parking lot and across the street to the mental health facility was in a a long three-story building in the park same parking lot as the main hospital and he went into the bathroom of the main floor of that mental health facility and went into a bathroom stall and with his bag and, and prepared his weapon in there. And it, it seems obvious now in, in hindsight that he knew exactly who he was going after. He, he had pr particular grievances against particular people. So uh, the, the first couple of people I want to say were targeted for sure. He wanted to make sure he got those. And then after that, just whoever happened to be walking by, is that, is that how you would look at it? Yeah. He, he had his first, two targets, the psychologist and psychiatrist, which were the first two people that he shot. And then after that, he just pretty much shot at anybody that moved. Yeah. And he shot a total of, was it, see, 26 people and four of them died. Yeah. He shot, um, there was 23 or 22 people that were wounded and there was, yeah, I think he shot 26, but five lives were lost because one of his victims who was wounded was pregnant and lost their unborn child so yeah i would definitely count that as a, as a lost life 
Uh, so he he starts shooting. When did you become aware this was going on, and what was the radio traffic like? And what were your first thoughts when you heard heard this going on? Well, that was a it was a swing shift, and I normally worked motorized patrol, but I had recently started a new uh, bike patrol that that they had initiated there. So I was on a bike patrol wearing black shorts and a white polo shirt with a with police written on the back. And my main objectives that day was just to patrol the housing areas on the base. So I had just finished patrolling the the housing areas located inside our perimeter fence and was going to head off base. There was two housing areas that were on either side of the hospital. And while I was headed that way, I stopped at the back gate, which was about three-tenths of a mile from the hospital. And was I ducked into the gate shack to uh, sit in the air conditioning for a minute because it was June day in, in eastern Washington. It's pretty hot. It's kind of a desert climate out here. Mm-hmm. So I was sitting there talking with the gate guard and a call came over the radio, Fairchild police to all posts and patrols. There's a individual in the hospital running around with a shotgun. And when I heard that, I, as soon as I heard Fairchild police to all posts and patrols, I jumped up and was headed to my bike because that's the, the preamble to a, an incident where we need to respond. And I was listening to the rest of the call as I was getting on the bike. And when he said there's a man with, at the hospital running around with a shotgun, I I was trying to imagine what kind of scenarios I might encounter. I didn't know if it was like a, a disgruntled patient or somebody's spouse running around just, just pissed off. I didn't know if any shots had been fired yet, but I immediately started pedaling that three tenths of a mile towards the the hospital. And somewhere between that first radio call and and me getting to the hospital, there was different reports came over the radio that shots had been fired and that people were down. But I don't actively remember hearing those. But I do remember as I was pedaling that. There's a straight road that led to the hospital. And I remember a sense of calm coming over me and the world around me kind of slowed down. And I had auditory exclusion already starting to happen because vehicles were driving towards me as they fled the hospital. And people were yelling out their windows and trying to get my attention. And I could not hear the words that were coming out of their mouth. So I just kept going. There was a dump truck that was coming towards me from the direction of the hospital there were people hanging off the sides of the the doors and inside the dump bed and they're all yelling down at me as i drove as i rode past and i couldn't understand what they were saying i couldn't really hear them all of the sounds around me were muffled can i just interject here really quick for those who haven't been in a critical incident and haven't experienced auditory exclusion it is very real it's reported by most of every all of our guests i've experienced it And the best analogy I can think of is if you've ever worn noise-canceling headphones, when you turn on the noise-canceling and all the noise just kind of goes and things get really quiet and you can almost hear your own heartbeat, it's kind of like that. So sorry to interrupt, Andy. Continue. No no problem. I appreciate that. It it was weird that it happened to me so soon, though. I hadn't even seen the shooter yet. I just heard that I'm responding to the scene where there's a guy with a gun. But... As I got closer to the hospital, there was a crowd of people in the street fleeing, running away from the area, and I didn't have a description of the shooter yet, so I kind of scanned the crowd as I rode towards them and then rode through them, didn't see any any threat. They were all dressed in military clothes, uh, Air Force whites and, and Air Force blues and camouflage and then some civilian clothes, but as I rode through the crowd, I said, where is he? And they collectively pointed behind themselves as they fled and said, there's a man with a gun. He's over there shooting people. And it was about that time that I heard the gunshots. And it sounded like they were outside. But I couldn't really tell what direction they are coming from because the sound was reverberating off of the, the hospital buildings and the housing areas, which were behind the perimeter fence on base. It's pretty much the hospital was surrounded by housing areas but i continued pedaling towards the area and uh, 
not too long after I heard the gunfire, I saw the individual standing in this, not standing, but he was in the street dressed in dark clothing, walking toward me on the road that I was on. And he had a long gun down at his hip and he was firing as he swung the rifle to his left and right. I didn't see it that he was actually targeting anybody. He just seemed to be randomly cranking rounds off. And the housing area to his right was down. The road that we were on was elevated. So it was as if he was cranking rounds off over the rooftops of the those houses. Okay. Um, but I, I identified him as a threat. So there's no doubt at this moment, no doubt in your mind, this is not... This is not a regular Air Force person doing anything they would normally be doing. It's it's readily apparent to you this is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. It, there would be no other reason for somebody to be carrying a rifle, let alone shooting one off. So um, as soon as I saw him, I coasted to the right and rode up onto a sidewalk, which was in front of the the hospital annex where the mental health facility, the mental health clinic was at. And as I jumped off the bike and drew my Beretta as I took up a kneeling position and yelled at the individual. I identified myself and yelled at him to police drop the weapon. And he continued to walk towards me and fired off another round. I could see people behind him in the street and hiding behind vehicles. I didn't feel comfortable shooting at him right at that moment because there were so many people in the field of fire behind him. But uh, after I yelled at him the second time, he pointed the rifle in my direction and began to fire. So I fired off four rounds in controlled succession. As soon as I could acquire and reacquire the, the sight picture, I was squeezing the trigger. There were people hiding in cars, under, like hiding underneath cars, that said that my first round looked like it struck him in the shoulder, but it didn't change his behavior. So that's why I continued firing. And on the fourth round, uh, he jumped up in the air, spun around, and landed flat on his back. All right, again, don't forget to tune in next week for the conclusion of this very special two-part episode of the Active Self-Protection Podcast, where I will finish up my discussion with Mr. Brown. Uh, now it is time for the Gutowski Files. We're going to go with starring Stephen Gutowski, who is at his uh, palatial uh, retreat uh, up in the Pennsylvania area. He is, he is uh, <laughs> deigned to come in and speak with us for a few moments. Stephen, how are you, sir? I'm doing well on on my mom's horse farm. Yes, taking taking care of the horses and the dogs and the chickens. I've I've seen uh, I've seen pictures. It looks very very idyllic, very uh, bucolic, if you will, up there. Very lovely. Yes, it's very nice. Um, it's a lot of work, of course, <laughs> right. taking care of the the farm. Um, but yeah, it's it's a nice change of scenery from you know the DC area for sure. Yeah, anything's a nice change of scenery from the DC area. I used to live there and uh, yeah, hard hard pass. I'm good. I'm good out here in, in God's country in Arizona. And you know, Stephen is not just uh, doing work on the farm. He's holding down uh the reload.com as well. He is the founder of the reload.com and the host of the weekly reload podcast, and I highly recommend you go over there and check that out and carefully consider giving him some of your money. He's got he's got bills to pay, and he relies on his members and his members alone uh, to support his important work. So this week, uh, we are talking about something that hits close to home for me and my old job as a special agent for the federal government on the southwest border. Uh, the, the title uh, over at the Reload is Mexico Files, New Suit Against American Gun Dealers. It is written by uh, Mr. Jake Fogelman, and that article came out a couple days ago. And I guess this is um, this story is news to me. I, St Stephen thinks we may have talked about it. Maybe we have. If we have, I forgot. But uh, not re not too long ago, a suit was dismissed, and Mexico is trying again to bring a suit against the American firearms industry. So, T Stephen, tell us what's going on with this. Yeah. So essentially, Mexico, with help from uh, Brady United, which is an American gun control group that commonly files these sorts of lawsuits, uh, you might remember. Uh, the the Sandy Hook Remington settlement from a little while back, which was predicated on the same basic idea that even though Remington didn't have any direct involvement in what happened with Sandy Hook in any sort of way, really, uh, you know, they, because one of their guns was used 
in in the attack that they should be held responsible for what happened. Uh, they should be held liable for it. And so Mexico is using the same basic argument about guns that are trafficked through the southern border into Mexico, which are later used to uh, kill people, you know, but generally by, you know, dr- drug cartels, obviously. And so they're, they've signed on to this lawsuit with uh, the Brady United people representing them, and uh, they're trying to make a series of gun stores in Arizona liable for gut murders in Mexico. Uh, now, they just had a very similar case, almost identical case against gun manufacturers dismissed by a federal court. Uh, because there's a federal law that protects gun companies against these sorts of lawsuits uh, that are viewed by many to be frivolous uh, because of their their claims about um, gun gun companies being responsible for the criminal acts of third parties that they weren't involved with. Um, and so now they're going back into court again to attempt the same strategy. And so I guess we'll We'll have to see how well it works out the second time around. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, we talked a little bit before we hit the record button, and th- this is kind of – would you characterize this as being more the Brady organization than the Mexican government? Because uh, th- the Mexican government, um, in my experience, is uh, less – well, how shall I, how shall I say this uh, politely? Uh, well, it's less than stellar. It's, it's one of the more corrupt uh, federal governments on the face of the planet – and they're 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 complicit in or they have been historically in my opinion from experience complicit in in the drug trade here's how it works folks uh drugs come north and money and guns go south that's our experiences at our agency basically doing customs work that's what happens um and and the, the guns we do our best to intercept them at the border um but we're frequently um unsuccessful because there's just so much of it these drug organizations have uh frankly have more money and more resources than we do um as the federal government does to try to combat this stuff so is it really the mexican government filing the suit behind the scenes or is it more the brady organization in your opinion it's definitely something that is part of a larger strategy from the brady uh organization because they've been filing these suits for years in an attempt to pierce the protection that the protection of the protection and lawful commerce and arms act gives to gun companies. This is something that um, gun control advocates have been very upset about for a very long time. They, uh, the president commonly talks about wanting to repeal the PLCAA whenever he speaks about guns. So it's sort of a, a boogeyman of, of the gun control organizations and it stems from this attempt uh, in the nineties to file by, by a lot of cities, a lot of mayors tried filing lawsuits of this nature against gun companies really with where the goal was not necessarily to actually win on the merits, uh, you know, to win the case, but to tie up the gun companies in court for, you know, years and basically make them pay a lot of money to try and defend against these these claims and um, you know, sort of a legal lawfare uh, against gun companies. And uh, that's where this federal law was born out of that uh, is a sort of a response by Republicans back in, uh, you know, 2004 and then the, during the Bush years to this tactic, which uh, uh, they're still trying today. It's just much harder now to get anywhere in these cases that was one of the things that was different about the Remington Sandy hook situation. They didn't win on the merits in that case either. That was a settlement by the insurance companies after Remington went bankrupt uh, for mainly for unrelated reasons, but, but it was a case that got a little bit further than people had expected. And uh, so that's been very encouraging, I think for a lot of gun control advocates who want to see the PLCAA repealed and want to try and defeat it in court. And so this, this effort is part of that larger campaign. And, you know, the Mexican government, 
I, if, you know, I, I don't know, I can't say for sure who initiated this sort of idea of, of doing this, whether it was the Mexican government and then they reached out to Brady or it was the other way around. But it does seem to me to be a fairly strange thing for the Mexican government to do because this is, these lawsuits are extremely unlikely to succeed and they're really sort of more symbolic things. And I mean, especially now, like they lost the first one and now they're going to their backup claims. You, know, you can imagine that there's, I would, I, there's probably not a lot of reason to think they're going to do better this time around uh, if they lost on their, what they clearly thought were their better, uh, better claims. So, um, you know, there seems to be a lot of political risk to doing something like this. And in, in my estimation for the Mexican government, because it's going to, alienate a lot of people in America who view this as an attack on their gun rights. Yeah. And uh, is there, you may not know, this might be out of your wheelhouse. Is there any analog to this in, in, in the world of lawsuits? Is there any other manufacturer that's being, they're trying to hold accountable for how their product is used like car companies or knife makers or anything else for that matter? No, generally speaking, there, there isn't, um, you know, you can't sue Ford if a drunk driver runs you over, right? right? Or someone it's plows not, into a crowd with a, you know, with a, a Chevy product or something. And Chevy's not responsible, right? For that. Like the like the parade uh, massacre that we saw a, a while back, where the that's uh, the, the suspects in trial right now. But but yeah, that you know, there's no attempt to sue the maker of that SUV uh, because it's viewed as a frivolous claim. Uh, and there, of course, are liability protections like the PLCAA for other industries. Uh, for instance, the um, vaccine, a, a lot of medical industries have special liability protections. Uh, the, the, the vaccine makers are one example, uh, of, uh, you know, the, probably the most recent example of this type of liability being uh, given. Out. And that isn't even for uh, that's that's a more general li- liability uh, protection than PLCAA because PLCAA, the thing about it too is, uh, for instance, the president is, is continually essentially lying about what it does uh, because he likes to say that it, that it protects them from all, all kinds of lawsuits and that no one else has similar protections. So well, that's not true. For one, the PLCAA does not protect gun companies from your normal liability suits over defective products, right? And that those happen fairly regularly to be honest, you know, uh, Six Hour has been sued over the P320. Um, Taurus has been sued. The, Remington's been sued over the uh, its trigger in the Remington 700. You know, there, there's a lot of lawsuits against gun companies over the normal product liability claims that you would see with other sorts of products. Yeah, and that and that's fine. We we should we should definitely delineate between that and what, what we're seeing here. That's you know, any company who puts out a faulty product that's dangerous. If you if you build a yeah. car that blows up when you turn the key or if you if you build a gun that uh you know the, the, the barrel explodes the first time you shoot it, obviously that's a valid lawsuit and should be brought, but this is something completely different. Right. So the PLCAA only protects gun companies from lawsuits related to their products working as designed but being used by third parties to com- commit crit- criminal acts, right? So, uh, and obviously if a gun company were, if you had evidence that they were um, involved in some sort of criminal activity, like uh, intentionally selling guns to people they knew were prohibited from having them, you could also sue them for that. Yeah, like that exactly. That's the thing. Like, it doesn't protect these gun companies from everything, just from the idea that they can be held liable for something they weren't directly involved with. Um, and, and, you know, that's another thing about this Mexico case. The, the second one is about gun dealers in particular. But you would imagine if they had evidence that these gun dealers, if they had direct real evidence that they had are facilitating trafficking of guns to Mexico. Well, that's illegal. Yeah, well, there'd be <laughs> criminal charges if that were the case. Yeah, you would you would think they'd report that to the ATF so that they could deal with it uh, instead of filing this, this civil claim. Uh, yeah. ATF has a bit of a spotty history when it comes to Mexico and guns. So, well, that's true, but, but presumably that would be the, the way you would handle actual evidence of, yes. of what they're claiming. Yeah. That would be ATF and that would be uh Homeland security investigations on the, on the custom side. So mm-hmm. interesting uh, folks, a couple things. If you've made it this far, 
do us a favor, and um, by us I mean me and um, our intrepid reporter, Mr. Gutowski, and leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can review us on Apple Podcasts. I don't know about other platforms. I've have had people reach out and say, hey, I can't leave you in a review review on Spotify, and that's true so far. Spotify only allows you to give a rating, but give us a five-star rating where you can. And if, if you made it this far, leave the name Gutowski. I'm going to spell it G-U-T-O-W-S-K-I in the in the header there to let me know you made it through. It's it's a fine Irish name, and it's a Polish name. <laughs> that's that's one of my dad's also part Irish. That's so. one of my dad's old jokes. He'd be like, uh, "Hey, this is my buddy um, Daniel Lipschitz. Oh, nice Irish boy." Uh, so <laughs> leave, leave us a review and go over and give Stephen a look over at thereload.com. And consider getting a membership there. Like I said, he, he relies on your memberships to keep that ship going, to bring us uh, ship, by the way, I said that ship going. He, he brings us stories like this so you don't have to dig through sort of the, you know, the, the, the media to find this stuff out. And we will um, almost certainly be following up on the results of this lawsuit in coming weeks. So, Stephen, thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next week. Absolutely. Hey friends, this is John Correa. If you like the podcast, if it is bringing you value, do me a favor and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. 